this is going to be a very long video, so I figured I would just get the introductory nonsense out of the way right now. Thank you for watching this video, be sure to like and subscribe if you feel so inclined, and follow my other social media profiles for more content every day. Also, my first EP is out now on Bandcamp to stream for free or purchase for $7. All support for my music is greatly appreciated, whether you choose to buy it or not. A link can be found in the description or in the comments. I also wanted to say something regarding the music I'm going to be talking about today. This is a band from Japan that sings in Japanese. Therefore, most of the song titles are in a language I do not speak. I will be attempting to pronounce the names of the musicians and the songs, but I cannot promise accuracy. I apologize in advance for any mistakes I might make along the way, and I hope that there are some Japanese speakers in the comments that can offer me some constructive criticism on my pronunciation. Now that that's all taken care of, let's get to the core content of the video. On December 28th of 1998, the Japanese dub band Fishmans played their final show at the Akasaka Blitz in Minato, Japan. This was the end of the band and the end of an era, but it was the beginning of a legacy. Hello everyone, and welcome to the OKS Computer YouTube channel. My name is Patrick, and today we're going to be talking about the Fishman's album 98-12-28 Otokotachi no Wakare, alternatively titled A Men's Farewell. As I was sitting down to write this script, I realized that trying to figure out how to talk about this album is really difficult. After all, this was the history, the discography, and the life of a band condensed into two hours of music. This is a dense and really complicated album, so I figured the best way to review it is to start from the beginning. Fishman's was formed in 1987 by lead singer and guitarist Shinji Sato, drummer Kenichi Motogi, and guitarist Kensuke Ojima. The trio would record a demo entitled Blue Summer, but when the band started to play shows around Tokyo, three quickly became four and bassist Yuzuru Kashiwabara joined the band. The band would continue to perform and occasionally record songs for compilation albums, and shortly after the addition of keyboardist Akase Sun to the lineup, the band would sign to Virgin Records Japan and release Chappie Don't Cry, their debut studio album. Fishman's quickly decided to stray further from their rock-steady roots, and a year later they would release the far more experimental album King Master George. All throughout the recording of these two albums, there were occasional singles and EPs that were released to high acclaim and exponentially rising popularity. This progressive rise to prominence only became more powerful when the single Ikareta Baby became a surprise success. The 1993 album Neo Yankees Holiday signaled yet another change in sound, this time much more funky and influenced by the Jamaican genre of dub. Shortly after the release of two more popular singles with Smiling Day's Summer Holiday and Melody, guitarist Ojima would leave the band and Fishman's would continue as four. The first full release with this quartet lineup was the pseudo-live album O oh Mountain. The band didn't consider this to be an official live album because of the large amount of mixing and overdubs that were added after the album's recording. Fishman's would then sign to Polydor Records, and this was the start of what Fishman's fans now consider to be the golden age of the band. The band's first Polydor single would be Night Cruising. This was followed by the release of the album Kuchikyamp, or Aerial Camp. This was the band's first venture into a dream pop sound, most notably with the classic single Baby Blue. At the beginning of the tours, in support of Kuchikyampu, Michigo Sekiguchi would join the band as a supporting guitarist. Then came Long Season. I'm gonna save a specific portion of the video to talking about Long Season and Long Season only. Let's move on. After the conclusion of the Long Season 96 tour, the band would begin to record with the software Pro Tools, and their seventh and final album Uchi Nippon Setagaya was produced with this more advanced technology. The track Walking in the Rhythm became quite popular, and the subsequent tour supporting Setagaya was named after that song. In 1998, the band released what would become their final single, Yurumeki in the Air, or Flickering in the Air. This was a 13-minute dream pop epic, similar to the styles of Setagaya and Kuchikampus. In a way, this was almost like a smaller companion single to Long Season. Following the song's release, bassist Kashiwabara would begin to express a lot of disinterest in Fishman's and in making music as a whole. He decided he would be leaving Fishman's at the end of 1998. In December of 1998, the band would embark on the Man's Farewell Tour as a way of saying goodbye to their bassist. The fifth and final show in the tour was played on December 28th, 1998, and the resulting live album was released to praise from critics and fans alike. 
Sato and Maltiki made plans to continue working on Fishman's, but those plans were abruptly ruined on March 15, 1999, when Sato tragically died of a sudden heart attack. 98-12-28 was the unexpected and permanent end of Fishman's, and they had no idea at the time. There was still hope for the band after Kashiwabara's departure, but losing Sato assured that they could never capture that magic again. Eventually, with the rise of music streaming services, and online forums like MU and Rate Your Music, Fishman's finally began to receive more international recognition. Sure, their music wasn't massively successful outside of Japan, but now there were communities of hundreds of thousands of music lovers listening to 98 12 28, and they loved it. It's just so devastating to think that a man as creative and wonderful as Sato never got to see just how many people around the world were so positively impacted by his work. This man devoted 12 years of his life to creating this beautiful music, and it took well over a decade after his death for him to finally get the praise he really deserved. I just wish that he could see us now and understand how significant his work really was. So that is a brief history of Fishman's discography. Now, let's narrow it down and dive deeper into 981228. The first song, Oh Slime, isn't actually a legitimate Fishman song. The band would often open their shows with several minutes of miscellaneous jamming, all while Sato introduced the members of the band. Since it's all a jam session, the song is different every time it's played. This time, the introduction is backed with the acoustic guitar chords from Long Season. It's very interesting that they start the show with an excerpt from a song that ends the show, and I love that attention to detail, even when the song is mostly improvised. The introduction of each musician is so fun to listen to. One of my favorite moments on the whole album is when the band asks the audience, Are you feel good? This is some of the only audience interaction that takes place on the album, so hearing that they address their fans right from the start is really nice. Sato joyfully shouts out each player's name and their corresponding instrument, followed by a brief chant of the person's name. All the while, the long season chords continue, and there are various riffs and solos sprinkled in from different instruments. Once the full band has been introduced, the music suddenly stops, and then there's an explosive final chord that officially starts the show. I love that Fishmans were very careful in their build-up of suspense to lure listeners in slowly, welcome them to the show, and then deliver the excitement. It's a slow but ultimately thrilling introduction. Night Cruising from Coochie Camp is the first full original song on the set list, which is another pretty peculiar choice to make. Despite being one of their most popular songs, Night Cruising is extremely mellow, so the sudden transition from the climactic finale of O Slime into what's essentially a ballad is a very bold decision. However, the song is so gorgeous that the odd transition doesn't even matter. Just like O Slime before it, this song follows a guitar riff looping over a progression of just two chords. One thing you'll notice as you listen to 98, 12, 28 and the rest of Fishman's discography is how they managed to make these amazing songs out of incredibly simple music. The song is guided along by the aforementioned guitars, soft piano chords, and occasionally a very simple drum beat. It's not terribly complicated, but the experience is greatly enhanced by subtle echoes reverberating off each instrument, the prominent reverb that's atmospheric but never overwhelming, and of course, Sato's vocals. This man has a voice that is his and his alone. There has never been another vocalist like Sato, and the uniqueness of his tone, the pronunciation of the lyrics, his astonishing vocal range, it's all just so hypnotic and blissful. The track's lyrics are also beautifully written, talking about a distant and struggling relationship. The two protagonists may be separated from each other, but through all kinds of changes, they try to stay together. It's a very nice concept for a song, and Sato's emotional wailing perfectly portrays the loving nature of the lyrics. I've always loved Night Cruising. It was the first song I ever heard by the band, and I think newcomers to Fishman's will find it very enjoyable. The song was made in a time when the band was leaning more towards the sounds of dream pop, and as a result, the calm, subtle groove and excellent guitars makes for one of the band's most accessible songs. The band decides to change directions and play an earlier song of theirs with Nantetano from King Master George. This is another fantastically performed ballad, this time with a faster tempo and more emphasis on the playing of keyboardist and violinist Honzi. The beautiful, shimmering guitar chords provide a canvas on which Honzi paints expansive layers of pianos, organs, and synthesizers. While most of these songs are dominated by Sato's vocals, Nantetano has a very densely packed instrumental palette that allows the keys to shine through as a truly essential part of Fishman's music. By 1998, the sounds the band had explored on King Master George were all but long gone, so it's a very pleasant surprise 
to see those earlier days equally represented in the setlist alongside their later material. Although Sato does a lot less on this song in terms of vocals, he still delivers a fabulous performance of a very poignant love song. The lyrics here seem to explore remorse and regret that can haunt someone after losing love. It's a very bittersweet and emotional song. My favorite line is definitely this one. If I look back, I can see you and how your face used to look. You look to me with that sweetness that was left in the wind. Your glance made time stand still. That is a powerful stanza of songwriting that I absolutely adore. Once again, I'm just in awe of Sato's raw talent on display in this show. The band picks up the pace with the song Thank You, a song that's actually incredibly rare in the Fishman's catalog. The only time it ever appeared on a commercial release was with a live rendition on O Mountain. I'm so happy they decided to play this very obscure song, because it ends up being one of the most joyful tracks on the album. Once again, the guitars are given a chance to shine, with Sato gleefully strumming syncopated reggae-style chords alongside a dangerously catchy slide riff. It's lyrically quite simple, with two of the most prominent lines being Thank you for my life, and now is not the time to do nothing. It's one of the most optimistic and funky songs I've heard of theirs, and Sato spends a majority of the song climbing up to the highest notes in his vocal range. The soaring vocals in the final minute of the song are just stunning, and the whole band joining him in the chorus makes it all the more grand and entertaining. Thank You may be the shortest song on the set list, but it is undeniably awesome. Shiawasisha, or A Happy Person, is another track from Kuchikyamp, and it's another marvelous reggae track. Here we have a song that shifts the spotlight over to Kashiwabara, whose infectious bass groove takes the lead in a masterfully crafted dub tune. This is a song where small details are very significant. It may not seem too intricate, since it follows a very rigid and simple form, and the chord progression is quite easy to follow. But in typical Fishman's fashion, just like with other songs, they find a way to make something small feel so much bigger than itself. Whether it's the colorful organ chords backing the chorus, the psychedelic slew of effects on the guitars, the delightful synth lead in the finale, or the quiet yet resonant vocal harmonies. There are so many seemingly minor details that add so much depth and flavor to this song. Lyrically, it's an examination of how always pretending life is okay will only end up making things worse. I love the moment when Sato says this. All of the world's unhappiness is just manipulated feelings and fake smiles, saying anything will do. That is one of my favorite Fishman's lyrics I've ever heard. Arguably the most emotionally stirring moment from the first half of the album is the song Tayori Naitenshi, another ballad from Kingmaster George. Unlike the earlier songs where one particular instrument really stands out, Tayori Naitenshi manages to find a balance, and every single instrument contributes equally to this wonderful song. Motoki slows down the drums even more on this song, to allow the off-kilter bass and staccato guitars to really control the groove. This is a relaxed, meandering, subtly surreal four-chord slow jam that is serene in its simplicity. Despite staying grounded in the reggae roots that helped Fishman's thrive in their early days, the song is just as calm and dreamy as something you might find on their later albums. So the sound of the song as a whole is amazing, but my god, these lyrics are something else. I, I just want to read these for you, because they are so well written. I know that when the angel comes down, she will be overjoyed. It's such a strange story that out of everyone in the world to think that I could be depended on. That girl told me once that an angel is coming. She was right. It isn't a lie. You know, the future is pretty bright. The feeling that the girl believed in is going to end up changing me. Once again, Sato is magnificent. He's not only one of the most unique singers I've ever heard, but he's such a compelling songwriter and storyteller. The band plays a surprising throwback song with Hikuki from Chappie Don't Cry. Like Shiawase Shaw before it, this is very much a reggae song, and lyrically speaking, it's very simple. You can tell that the band was still very young and slightly inexperienced when they recorded this song, because it's literally just a story about watching an airplane fly. This much older, more mature Fishman's breathes new life into one of their first songs, and despite being the only song from Chappie on the set list, it's played with the same charm and energy as the rest of the songs, so it doesn't feel like a bizarre detour. It just works. Then comes one of my favorite Fishman songs, the Setagai classic In the Flight. This is a very introspective and philosophical song, which is definitely out of the band's comfort zone, but once again, Sato delivers in the lyrics, and it is gorgeous. I especially love this line. Outside your door, I thought about it. In ten years, you should be able to do anything. But of course, that is just a lie. Of course you can't do anything. I can't do anything. 
Ponzi's keys dominate most of the track with various shades of electric piano, organ, and synthesizers floating on top of a smooth jazzy drum beat. But that stops in the second half when she suddenly begins a brilliant violin solo. Her extended series of echoing glides and piercing high screeches are just otherworldly. It is indescribably transcendental. There's also a very unexpected hip-hop drum breakdown in the final minute as a transition into the next song. It shows that the band had a knack for sampling, just like the dub artists that influenced them. The song that follows is Walking in the Rhythm, one of the band's most famous songs. It's easy to see why, given the English language chorus is irresistible and really easy to sing along to. Sato writes about walking down a long, cold path and wishing to be one with music, walking the way that he sings. That idea of using positive music to influence a positive life really captures the essence of Fishman's music, and hearing that reflected in such a vibrant and catchy song is delightful. Once again, the use of sample drums is very impressive, and the contrast between the digital loops and the live drums creates an unusual but surprisingly steady groove. I can tell that if Fishman's were to continue, that they would have further explored that digital sound and found a way to incorporate it into their music like they did with Walking in the Rhythm. That would have been wonderful to hear, considering this song turned out as amazing as it did. Oh, and do yourself a favor and listen to Smiling Day's Summer Holiday today. By doing so, you'll be listening to one of the most joyful songs I've ever heard. The trumpet lead, the immaculate vocal harmonies, the funky drums, the killer bass line, Sato's falsetto. How can a song even be this good? The first half of the album ends with Melody, the only song on here from the album Orange. This is a very interesting song to me, because the emotions in the music are entirely separate from the emotions in the lyrics. Musically speaking, there are more soaring synth leads, syncopated funky guitars, and a prominent bass line, all ingredients of a Fishman's song that should be very upbeat and fun. This is enhanced even more by the immensely catchy chorus. However, the lyrics are uncharacteristically sad. The joyful melodies are really misleading, and Sato is actually very unhappy in the lyrics here. My melody is always dark. The light flew in through the window, causing my head to cry out. I saw the world of nothing that I saw 20 years before. Happiness that ends soon. Joy that ends soon. Why is it this sad? It's a sad and contemplative song hidden behind the veil of an infectious groove. A very creative way to end the first half of the show. Overall, the first disc of 98-1228 is just marvelous. The band crafts a powerful blend of impressive notable singles and phenomenal deep cuts from their early years. They make drastic changes from reggae jams, to slow ballads, to dream pop gems, to fabulous rock songs, and they never miss a beat. They acknowledge, celebrate, and rejuvenate songs from their entire discography, including songs the audience might not even be familiar with. They knew exactly what they were doing with every song, forming flawless transitions that make the entire 67-minute runtime feel so perfect and focused despite the wide variety of the material. <laughs> Moving on to the second half of the album, this is the grand finale, and although it's only three songs, it is the highlight of the show and arguably the finest moment in Fishman's career. The setlist of the second album is unique, to say the least. The band starts with an epic-length single that was released a mere three weeks before the show, followed by a neo-Yankee single, and then it ends with the performance of an entire studio album. Playing a brand new EP, a pretty old single, and then an entire album, is an abnormal way to end the show and their career. It's a weird setlist by traditional concert standards, but once you listen to it, you'll understand that this abnormally formatted setlist is the smartest and greatest decision the band ever made. Yurumeki in the Air is by far one of the dreamiest and spaciest songs in the band's discography. Sato's vocals on this song are very hushed and less prominent than on other songs, and although they're still gorgeous, a lot of the brilliance of Yurameki comes in the instrumental. The guitars here are as simple as guitar parts get, with the lead plucking straightforward arpeggios and Sato jumping in to strum a few chords in the chorus. There are varying amounts of tremolo and phaser stacked on top of each other in the rhythm guitar, as well as a seemingly endless delay in the lead. And that makes these incredibly simple guitar parts shimmer and reverberate with magnificent results, like you'll never want them to stop ringing out. This is also the case with Hanzi solo in the middle of the track, like you'll see later with Long Season, she is a killer violinist. Her solos may not be very complex or furious, but the slow weeping of the strings is just heart-wrenching with every note. My favorite moment by far comes after Hansi's solo, with two vocalists trading riffs and variations on the phrase in the air. As the great Adam Neely once said, repetition legitimizes, repetition legitimizes, repetition legitimizes, and trust me when I say, 
This is some legitimately great repetition. Eventually, the backup vocals stop and Sato runs wild with a series of wails and siren-like hollers. Once again, this man's high notes are astonishing, and I'm just blown away by how impressive his falsetto is. The best way to go about listening to Yoramaki is to just sit back and let the subdued jam session consume you. There is an immense calm that is generated from this music, and the feeling that the song creates is simply euphoric. The two epic length tracks are broken up by the blissful single Ikareta Baby. You can tell this was one of the band's most popular tracks because shortly after Sato's solo verse in the intro, there is a sudden moment of uproarious applause. Most of the crowd noise is completely removed from this album, so hearing the fans cheer for this magnificent song is so refreshing and satisfying. I'm glad that the crowd loves Ikareta as much as they do, because this is a joyful and relaxed reggae track that is wonderfully simple and simply wonderful. This song features my favorite drum performance on the album, and the prominent influence of dub and hip-hop on Montague's drums leads to a syncopated looping drum beat that is so tight and accurate, but is also very, very funky. Ikareta Baby isn't very long or revolutionary, but having these two expansive epic tracks broken up by the playing of this beloved single allows for one final glimpse at the classic sound of Fishman's before the final song. The show ends with a performance of Long Season. It's hard to put into words how exactly I feel about Long Season, but I'll certainly try. Long Season was recorded over the course of two months with the intention of creating one full album-length song. The band began composing by expanding upon a single released earlier that year entitled Season. This was a non-album song that has since faded into obscurity, due to only appearing on a CD single and on compilations in the 2000s. The band decided to take the lyrical and musical themes of Season and expand them into a much grander, more developed 35-minute song. There was a whole host of guest musicians hired to create Long Season. Keyboardist Hanzi was still new to the band at the time, and this was also the first album of theirs to feature Sekiguchi on guitars. There were also a lot of backup vocalists included in the recording, such as K-pop singer Mari Mari and vocalist UA. While these extra vocalists aren't included in the live rendition, their vocal contributions help to greatly improve the studio recording. This live rendition of Long Season is much simpler than the original, and while it may seem like a tough task to cover the work of 15 people with a band of only 5, this extended five-man band version of Long Season is somehow just as grandiose and electrifying as it was in the studio. The song is divided into five distinct sections, each one very different from the last. This wasn't originally the plan, but dividing the song into segments made it easier for CD and vinyl releases, as well as offering an organized layout for each phase of the composition. The first is a sharp two-note guitar lead that pierces the silence and echoes through the speakers, coded in reverb, and it offers the first of many excellent guitar riffs to appear throughout Long Season. Kashi Wabara brings in the low end with a killer bass line, one of my favorites ever recorded. The constant switching between the lower and upper registers of the bass create a very unique and dynamic bass sound, only enhancing the vast ambiance generated by the resonant treble in the guitars. The next set of melodies add a lot more spice to the composition, Instead of simply dwelling on one chord like before, the band establishes the first full chord progression in the song. The keys and guitar simultaneously begin a short and sweet melody that appears sporadically throughout the song. The unique tone that's crafted by combining the crunchy guitar and bright searing synth notes is such a colorful sound unlike anything I've ever heard in a song. As this happens, Haunty plays a series of piano arpeggios that repeat constantly throughout the next 40 minutes. It's a wonderful set of chords, one that every Fishman's enthusiast has come to know and love. It repeats for a majority of the track's runtime, so you may think that 40 minutes of this piano line might get tiresome, but it's the exact opposite of boring. In fact, with every repetition of the arpeggio, it becomes so hypnotic and transcendental, almost like it's less of a tangible melody and more of its own being. This consistent piano ostinato flows out in an endless stream of flawless notes almost like it's too perfect to be played by human hands. It seems so absurd to think that 64 piano notes can stir such a surreal emotion in the listener, but it does. This piano melody feels so much bigger than a piano melody, and I think that's beautiful. When Sato enters with the vocals, the listener is cast off on a hazy journey with lyrics shrouded in mystery, almost like visions of a long-gone dream. At dusk we drove, calling the wind and calling you, we ran from one end of Tokyo to the other, halfway dreaming. In a dream, what is that song you are humming? 
What comes to mind? Watching the sunset in the rearview mirror. Feeling kind of happy. Feeling kind of lonely. Seems like I've been done in by my cold medicine. And like that, I'm driving. I honestly think this is the best songwriting we've gotten from Sato. The brilliant instrumental perfectly accompanies the brilliant lyrics. The instantly atmospheric opening line, uttered with a fragile tone like Sato's, immediately entrances the listener. The constant repetition of the line about being halfway in a dream allows us to dig even deeper into this psychedelic abyss and fully embrace the experience that Sato provides. There is absolutely nothing that matches the emotions of hearing this man sing Long Season. It is as peaceful and serene as a vocal performance gets. The vocals are intermittently broken up with invigorating solos from each band member. There are multiple astonishing guitar solos, as well as a great accordion solo. And despite the simplicity of the playing, the multitude of effects and the flawless mixing allow every one of these notes to brilliantly soar instead of falling flat. Possibly the most impressive instrumental input we get is, once again, from the violin. Hansi's additions to the song make for one of the most excellent violin performances I've ever heard. The layers of reverb slathered onto the violin leave it sounding less like a bowed instrument and more like beautiful, inhuman singing. That same description can be applied to the song as a whole. It's so beautiful, it's almost inhuman. This 42 minutes does not feel like 42 minutes. It feels like being lost in a vast landscape of musical euphoria, like being trapped in a beautiful dream that you never want to wake up from. Long season feels like life is perfect for a moment. I am absolutely enamored with every aspect of this song. The perfection crafted within long season makes me feel like no other song possibly can. There has never been another long season and there will never be another long season. And it's yet another reminder that there will never be another Shinji Sato. I wish he could have continued his work. I wish he could have lived to see the internet age and see the massive amount of people that have had their lives changed for the better by his band. I wish he could see this video so I could thank him for making this song. Nobody deserves to die that young, especially not someone who makes a song like this. Okay, so now that we've been through this extravagant two-hour performance, I think it's time we answer the question. Is this the ultimate concert experience? Did Fishman's make the perfect live album? And you know what? I think they did. I know it's a bold statement to make, but I think they really did it. These people performed a once-in-a-lifetime show and used it to create a live album that's as close to perfect as it gets. I've thought about it a lot in the past few weeks. I've tried so hard to think of something to criticize, and I just can't. What Fishman's made with 981228 was originally going to be a grand send-off for an extremely skilled bassist that deserved nothing but the best in the rest of his career and his life. With the sudden death of Shinji Sato after the show, the album has multiplied in its emotional magnitude. Now, it's not only a tribute to the rhythmic backbone of Fishman's, but it's also the last goodbye of a brilliant musician who made some of the finest records in modern music, but never got the recognition he fully deserved. Sato was an excellent performer in every way. He was a poignant songwriter, a powerful rhythm guitarist who always had an ear for the perfect groove, and he had one of the most glorious voices I've ever heard. This final two hours of Fishman's existence was the last gift Sato gave to the world, and with every word, every riff, and every song, he made an artistic statement that the world needed to hear. And that is why, in my humble opinion, 981228 Otokotachi no Wakare is my favorite live album. Thank you so much for bearing with me as I rant about this band for an extended period of time. This has been a wonderful but exhausting video to make, and so the next video will be something that is a lot easier to absorb. I will be ranking the studio albums of singer-songwriter Phil Elvrum. I will be going over his 15 studio albums and ranking them worst to best. Phil is one of my favorite singers, so I'm so excited to have a video talking about his work. And that's the end of the video. As always, remember to like and subscribe if you feel so inclined, follow my other social media profiles for more content every day, and give my new EP a listen. I think you'll like it. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you all have a very nice day.